Yes. Sí. Sí. Sí, 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 claro. Sí. Okay, so I am in charge of asking everyone to kindly take a seat.
so that we can get to the questions and actually have time to answer them. <laughs> so for those in the coffee section, please start coming. <laughs> So let me get started, because always like the first minutes are not that important anyways. Uh, so my name is Lorena Bello, and I am an architect and urban designer teaching here at the Graduate School of Design in the Department of Landscape Architecture, where this semester I am actually teaching a seminar uh, named Resilience Under New Water Regimes, um, the case of Monterrey Day Zero. Uh, so I am extremely thrilled to be uh, here at the conference uh, these this two couple of days. I will have actually the opportunity to talk about uh, my work for the last two years in the Appan Plains uh, in the Valley of Mexico later at 5 p.m. Um, at the opening of the little exhibit uh, Reimagining Water Futures that I have curated together with my colleague uh, Tad Bombay and my students Selina Ava and Arti Bartanian showing the work of three studios um, taught here at the Graduate School of Design in the falls of 2021 and 2022 in the Department of Landscape. So for those watching um, online and in Cambridge or in the building, because I know that all our students are in the building watching, that is a after COVID effect, um, I would kindly um, invite you to join us at, at Porticos at uh, 5 p.m to enjoy some good food and wine, and to learn, in my case, about the Aqua Incognita Studios and how we de decipher and reimagine a, a new liquid future in the Appan Plains in the Valley of Mexico. And I use the opportunity to thank our local partners, Gustavo Madrid and Charlotte Chambard, who I know are watching us this morning, hello, uh, and that couldn't be here as very soon they will be showing in Congress some of the results of our collaboration trying to enforce governance at the water set level together with Sam Tabori and Diane, um, as well as nature-based solutions that could help improve the water cycle in the face of global commodity change depleting the aquifer. So in all this work, I have enormously benefited from the work of the amazing scholars that I am about to introduce. Uh, so I am deeply grateful to professors Diane Davis and Gabriela Soto Laveaga for the opportunity uh, of moderating this panel and for bringing together such an interdisciplinary group of scholars to this conference. Um, for me, this is telling of one very important thing, uh, that if we want to better a better future for our urbanized territories, we will have to not only break the Cartesian, Cartesian silos that we have um, created over time, we will also have to collaborate and learn how to bring that knowledge into actionable ideas and collaborative projects to envision a future with one of the most important resources that allows us to live in this planet, water. And I leave it there. So my first speaker of the uh, morning is uh, Professor Liz Roberts, hello Liz. Um, let me move this. Liz is a professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan who investigates scientific and public health knowledge production and its embodied effects in Latin America and the United States. One of the key aims of Professor Roberts' current work in the development of a bio -ethno um, is the development of bioethnography a method that combines social and life sciences approaches in order to make better knowledge about health and inequality. She's currently finishing a book manuscript called In Praise of Addiction, Devotion and Defiance in Mexico City. Elizabeth's presentation is named, as you can read, Intermittency and Domestic Labor in Mexico City and Mexico 
where she will discuss a multi-year, multidisciplinary water project, ethnography, engineering, and environmental health in Mexico City, and her findings about the impact of water intermittency on everyday life in Mexico City. Thank you for being here today. Matthew, yes? <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Beats uh, is Associate Professor uh, of Latin American History at UC, UC San Diego. He's the author of a marvelous piece of work, A City on a Lake, uh, Urban Political Ecology and the Growth of Mexico City. He's also a contributor to the Cambridge Elements Global Urban History Services, which will soon publish his short book, Globalizing Urban Environmental History. Bits has also written various, ar various articles and book chapters on the urban and environmental history of Mexico. Matt's presentation this uh, afternoon already, or almost, the latex cocoa problem, water imaginaries and environmental governance in the basin of Mexico since 1900, will reveal how a historical perspective on the latex cocoa problem allows a deeper understanding on the contemporary movements to rescue late Xochimilco and make the old Texcoco bed an ecological park. Thank you so much for being here with us, Matt, today. <laughs> Dr. Manuel Berlo Cohen is an economist from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, and PhD in city and regional planning from UC Berkeley that he actually wrote under the guidance of our beloved Manuel Castells. Manuel is a tenure researcher at Instituto de Investigaciones Sociales at UNAM since 1980 that he directed from 2013 to 17 after his tenure as director of UNAM's program of urban studies from 2000 to 2009. From the many topics that he has studied, his work on the history of water and sewage provision in Mexico City, water sustainable development policies in Mexico, or urban river restoration are incredibly valuable to understand Mexico City's urbanization in relationship to water. I got actually to meet Manuel through my classmate here, Loretta Castro, uh, through their collaboration in the design of Parque La Quebradora, for which they received the gold prize uh, at the fifth cycle of the Large, uh, large uh, the Farts Holcim Awards for Sustainable um, Construction. The very suggestive title of Manuel's lecture today, Making Visible the Invisible, A Path to Groundwater Sustainability, will be covering the need to revert a very perilous trend toward aquifer depletion. Uh, last but definitely not less important, Dr. Luis Zambrano, is a biologist and PhD in ecology from UNAM and has a postdoctorate in aquatic ecology and water management group from uh, Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands. He has over 100 publications and is member of the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program of Stanford University and the Mexican Academy of Sciences. I was actually at the presentation of his book with his friend Ruben Rojas at Xochimilco uh, on his 20-year hard work on the conservation of chinampas in Xochimilco through refuge chinampas, or what he calls chinampas refugio. Luis presentations today, uh, analyzing the water crisis from the urban ecosystem perspective, will be based on considering that cities are established within ecosystems uh, with their own water dynamics, and that understanding the basin's dynamics and as a hydrological unit can help generate solutions toward supply and, fl and flood control. Um, and he will be using Xochimilco and Bosque de Agua as case studies. So you see that like my work was very, very easy this uh, morning afternoon, and I will try to be as good as uh, Gabriela with time. Uh, so I will invite our first speaker, Liz, to take the floor, and then uh, I will give you like five, two minutes uh, um, sign warning, uh, but I will let you finish what you have to say this morning. <laughs> but. Yes, but uh, please welcome me to join all of this amazing panel. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> okay. 
So first of all, where's the little thing that allows me to make it go forward? Oh, it's that thing. Wait. I think. Oh, yeah. Play. Like this. Oh. Yes. But then how do you and go then back? Reverse okay. Oh, hello. Okay. Hmm. Oh. Not where is the button? There it is. Oh, you, I had to do it harder. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. I am so excited and so grateful to be here. So grateful to Diane and Gabriella for inviting me. Um, I'm fairly new to water and I'm really a figurehead for a whole bunch of other people. And I'm here learning and it's been such a long time since I've been to a conference where I know almost no one and that's so exciting. It's just, you know, I knew Gabriella and I've heard of many of you, but this is, uh, to be able to learn from you all and to bring together this level of expertise around something we all care about deeply is pretty exciting. Um, like I said, I'm just a figurehead for a whole bunch of people and um, Lorena mentioned that I work with people in environmental health and environmental engineering, but also in that group of people are political scientists, Alyssa Huberts, who, got, who just dis, uh, defended her dissertation here in Poli Sci, um, who's taught me so much about urban governance through water. And then lately, and I'll talk about this near the end of my talk, um, I'm working with a bunch of health economists um, in, in Mexico as well. So, and I, like a lot of anthropologists, I kind of came, I come to my topics through hanging out with people, not because they're the things I go looking for. So I feel like water came to me. And I'm overall interested in health and inequality and the relationship between those things. Um, so, like I said, it came to me. So, I mean, I'm not telling most of you here very much that's new about intermittency. Um, but this is where this talk is going. Um, it's about how we, this um, myself as an anthropologist and this group of scholars and researchers who came together started seeing that we could think about intermittency at, um, in new ways potentially in Mexico. Um, intermittency is, an, is a condition that is very common worldwide. Over a billion people live with intermittent water systems. It's expected to grow, um, just as a definition, in case you don't know, it means you don't have a water supply 24 seven. And intermittency in the health literature is usually linked to infectious disease um, or things like diarrhea. But one of the things that we're hoping that we can demonstrate or that we have a hypothesis that might be true is that when we think about an intermittent water supply, we should be thinking a lot more about chronic conditions. And that really isn't on the radar yet in the, in the health literature. And I'll go into why that is in a minute. And the last thing I wanna say before I move on from this slide is I found our panel last night very inspiring. And I think that it's tricky to talk about any issue when we're talking about inequality, and as I'm gonna show, and you won't be surprised, um, intermittency is unequal, but also what I'm gonna talk about is the incredible ways that people adapt to intermittency. And I think that yesterday's panel helped me articulate a little better a way that I think we need to notice our expectations of what the norm should be. So we were talking about these kinds of forms of living that are based on a kind of permanency when so many of the panelists yesterday were talking about um, kind of dynamic systems that change constantly. So again, when we think about intermittency, and I, one of the things that I've been interested in learning about it is it doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. And in fact, given that it's gonna be more of our futures, I think there's some really good pieces of news to share about how people already live with intermittency. But again, I think we need to think about it in more equitable ways. And, um, but again, intermittency could, you know, dynamism is probably the way of the future in all kinds of ways. So just to give you a little bit of background, I'm an ethnographer. There I am being an ethnographer in the back of um, a, a good friend's kitchen, writing, taking little field notes as she's cooking and sharing her life with me. That's a long time ago. Um, and in 2012, I started collaborating with an environmental health project in Mexico City called Element. 
they are a long-term, well, they're a longitudinal birth cohort study that looks at the impact of chemical exposure over the life course. Currently, they have about 800 mother-child mother match pairs that were recruited through the EAMS systems when the children, um, right when they were born or actually when they were in utero. So I started collaborating with this project element by doing a year-long open-ended ethnography of daily life, health, and inequality in two working-class neighborhoods in Mexico City, one closer to the centro, más o menos, and one more to the south in um, Tlalpan. And I worked very intensely with six families and their neighbors, and also my landlady's families, and did the thing ethnographers do, which I actually wasn't really looking for anything specific. Um, I wanted to know about everyday life, and I was very interested in the fact that uh, the data I was gathering about, well, these families had a long-term biobank of their biological data going back 25 years at that point. And so the idea was to kind of put these different kinds of data sets together. Over time, some of the um, environmental health folks in that project have come to say that what I produced in that year was what they now think of as a semillero, a seedbed for understanding the larger histories, life circumstances, and environments that shape health, disease, and inequality among their participant population. So, one of the big things that emerged was water. You know, not a shocker. Um, and I'm a medical anthropologist, so I was really interested in how all over Mexico City, all over the, the landscape, were disease, well, diseases, yes, maybe, but there were billboards telling people, don't drink soda, drink water. There's commercials all the time telling people, don't drink soda, drink water. And I started working with urban water ecologists at Lances, which is within UNAM. And they were teaching me that when water is delivered to the majority of households in Mexico City, it meets international water quality safety standards. So, but ethnographically, I was learning in households that no one drinks water. I mean, to an extent, yes, but really mostly people drink soda or they drink bottled water. So what is going on? What's the set of the relationships that is making it that there's these conflicting messages, there's supposedly a condition of water that it meets water quality sta safety standards, but people are saying, no, we're not gonna, or would not drink water. And as probably many of you know, Mexico is the number one consumer of Coca-Cola products in the world, that includes also water, most of you know about Vicente Fox here. And Mexico has some of the highest rates of diabetes and cardiovascular disease in the world. So this is considered a public health crisis in all kinds of ways and is very much linked to the consumption of soda and chatara, junk food. But soda, many of you have probably heard of the soda tax and things like that. So I was trying to understand more, and I could see it at the scale of six families, and they told me a lot about um, things like why soda, so, well, the fact that soda is so cheap and that water is heavy and soda is not cheap. Also, if we had longer, I would talk a lot more about the role of soda and the kind of enjoyment and connectivity it brings to people that I think is very, very important. But I was also hearing a lot of things about the 1985 earthquake and how people drank water from the tap directly before then. And, um, and there's a million things that I was hearing about. So when I finished that project and was working with some of my collaborators, over time we came together to create this project that called, got called NESMEX and was funded by a really interesting mechanism at the NSF, the National Science Foundation. It was a bigger grant than they usually give to fund people, disciplines who usually don't work together. So it was environmental engineers and anthropologists, but also people from public health. And what we did is we recruited 60 households from the larger element cohort. They were dispersed throughout 38 neighborhoods in Mexico City. And we designed a project where we went into people's houses three times each, that got a little messed up by the pandemic, but that was the project design. And we were going in and we were gathering data about water in 
any way that people wanted to share it with us, we did open-ended interviews, we gathered a fair amount of data about water quality, and including using these really interesting water sensors that I can talk more about later if you want. Learned a lot about water pressure. We also gathered biological samples, epigenetic and cortisol samples. And what I, um, actually this was more me, I was working mostly with people who when they do projects, they have a hypothesis they were testing. But because I was in charge, I got to say we have no hypothesis. Um, <laughs> anthropologists don't go in immediately with hypothesis. In fact, we usually never have them. So it's weird for me that I have one now. But I was saying this project is gonna help us form hypotheses hypotheses about um, the relationship of dr people to drinking water within households in Mexico City. And that was kind of a stretch for them, but they bore with me for a while. So we found out a lot of things that we're still analyzing, and um, but the main thing that we found out about was something that I kind of knew ethnographically but couldn't fully articulate the, its importance until we did this larger study. And that's about intermittency. And again, this is, you know, this is, you could say, kind of a ground up sort of finding. Not a surprise that intermittency shapes water, but because we were working together in a team, I think we were able to find out much more about the impact of intermittency um, in many ways. So intermittency necessitates storage. Very simple observation. But storage dramatically shapes the ecology of water in households. The other thing storage and intermittency do together, I think you have to think of them together, is that it creates the need for water management. And especially in households that don't have a huge amount of resources, meaning they can automate the system, it requires a lot of hands-on labor. For instance, women I knew pretty well would have to get up at three in the morning when they hear the water come and to go turn on the pump to move the water around the house. That actually impacts the rest of your day in all kinds of ways that you know we could think through. So especially in low resourced houses, water management and storage is really a lot about gender domestic water management. And what we also found out was that all kinds of residents told us, yeah, the water is fine from the city. We don't trust it because it sits in the storage. And that's one of the big reasons we don't drink it. So we learned a lot about intermittency and the threat of intermittency. Most people worry about water scarcity. Even people who have a continuous water supply design systems to manage intermittency and shutoffs, like the shutoff that happened two falls ago that many of you, I'm guessing, left the city for because you had the means to do it. Um, and we also found out a lot about people's pride in their conservation practices. And if I had had more time, I would put up pictures of, you know, all the ways that people conserve waters, even in washing machines and using gray water and recycling. I mean, it's incredibly impressive. So there's also a fair amount of fear about the increasing scarcity in the future, but then also a lot of pride in people, especially women's capacity to manage the water and take care of their family. So these are a few images I'm going to show um, that were worked up by um, our engineering PhD student, Ernesto Martinez. And what we were able to show through combining ethnographic data, observation in the households, and then his work doing water quality analysis was that these systems that people produce in their homes, and they're, they're, they're self-built. As, as you mostly know. These systems that bring in water from a public supply, that then the water can be taken to a cistern, and a pump can be manual or automatic, can be used to get the water up to the tinaco, where it then comes down to the kitchen sink, or stored in buckets. We have the bucket icon there. These are super, they're super useful. They're adaptive. They, they are very, very powerful, but they do declare, de decay water quality in all kinds of ways. So what we were able to show was that, and this is a pretty simple thing, water quality when it comes in at the meter, at the llave, 
usually is at a certain level, again, often meeting water, international water quality safety standards, but by the time, and then we took samples along the way from the Tinaco in the cistern and then at the top, and then you were able to see this deterioration of water quality um, by the time it gets to the kitchen tap. And this is another slide that's showing a very similar thing. So from the houses that received good quality water, 65% um, had decreasing chlorine concentrations um, by the time it got to the tap. Oh, crap, okay. All right, so we found out that, of course, household members sense this deterioration in quality. They have intimacy with their water. They know this. Um, so we have someone saying, I think that the water tanks in the system pollute the water. Um, so I've already mentioned this. I think there, we learned a lot about managing intermittency and what, what people do to make intermittency enough. And in fact, uh, this is a whole longer conversation. A recent um, national survey found out that most people say they don't suffer from water insecurity, but they hadn't done the ethnographic work, the survey takers, to know that that's because of how the amount of labor people put in to making it so that they are actually water secure at a certain level. Okay, so I've already talked about some of the cost. So what we were able to do with the data from 60 households is start asking new kinds of questions, um, generating hypotheses, as you will. And that led to one of the members of our team who was at the INSP in Cuernavaca talking to these health economists that are a big part of the Ensanut, which probably several of you are familiar with. It's the nationally representative health and nutrition study that is done every year in um, Mexico, across Mexico. And we were able, kind of still can't believe it, a year ago we were doing this, we were allowed to create a module to count and measure water intermittency at the national level for the first time ever on the Insanut. Um, and we were allowed 15 questions that were ethnographically derived, and that um, also surprised us that we got so many. And we were trying to get at ways that we could really understand what the landscape of intermittency looked like for people nationally. So I'm gonna quickly go over, there's about four slides. We have just gotten the data back about a month ago from Insanut, and I only have kind of the really big picture stuff at this point. But one big finding in this, um, I think surprised <laughs> the health economist, was that in the, so the survey was, many of the questions were about in the last four weeks. Again, this is a national sample. Only 31% of households did not experience intermittency in the last four weeks. And in the entire national sample, only 17.4 had continuous water throughout the year. Um, and we also learned, um, of course, something we knew ethnographically, but now we were learning at a national level, that households who received water daily still were experiencing various kinds of weekly intermittency. And several people had, or several households had water less than three days per month. We found, um, and this was surprising to um, many of the folks um, that on this team, that it's the Pacific regions and the lowest SES, that part's not a surprise, lowest SES, but the Pacific regions have the most intermittency and the North has the least. Um, Monday? Oh, socioeconomic status, I'm sorry, okay. So, um, and then we have a lot of um, data about how nationally 81% of households store water, 64.4% um, in tinacos and cisterns, and 16.3% in buckets. And one of the things we found is that in the north, more people just use buckets, probably because there's less intermittency overall. Um, okay. So there's a whole bunch of implications, and I think I'm really out of time. Oh, okay, <laughs> just barreled through those as quickly as possible. Um, so the the health survey I or the re survey I referred to a little while ago was also put on the Ensanut. It's called the HYS, and what they are doing is they are measuring what they call water insecurity. And to me, it's an example of how if you don't use ethnography <laughs> to start um, helping you form your survey, you might not ask the right questions. So, um, and that's kind of my message when I go around in these interdisciplinary forums. You need ethnography. So they ask people about water insecurity. And they, like I said, found that only 20% of people in the Ensanut said they had water insecurity. Well, our findings show something 
pretty dramatically different. We're not asking about a feeling of insecurity. Again, we found that people, women especially, are quite proud of the labor they put into making sure they and their households don't feel water insecure. So by asking about intermittency, you get a more granular and I would say accurate portrait of what water looks like in households. Um, the other thing is one of the big stories in Mexico, as it, in many, as it is in many places, is, oh, we've solved water in Mexico. 95% of people have piped water. But if there isn't water in the pipes, of course, you have a problem or you have problems. Um, I already kind of went over this. Households adapt to the water supply they have. And of course, um, <laughs> the, the less resources you have, the more time you have to spend in adaptation. And we spent um, a lot of time in a paper that just came out um, going over what it means to make scarcity enough. It's um, an open access paper, Plus Water came out two weeks ago, making scarcity enough. And I'm just gonna go back to this really quickly. Go back. Um, and I think that one of the things our whole team has been learning is just how well intermittency can work. But the thing that is not really not being, well, two big things are not being addressed. I'm sure there's more. But one is the inequality of the intermittency. And we can think more about what would it be like to spread intermittency more widely and have more people adapt. But the other thing is intermittency might work but that is going to dramatically impact drinking water and people's interest or capacity to want to drink the water that comes out of their taps. And that's an issue that I think is going to be at hand in many places in the world. I mean, Los Angeles is thinking about doing intermittency sometimes. How is that gonna impact drinking water? So some of the things we come up with in um, this recent publication is that policymakers could start thinking about provisioning households beyond the grid and the way they think about the grid. And some of Enrique's, I think, work in Isla Urbana also gets at these kinds of issues. Um, we could, there could be all kinds of ways to make the water at the tap viable and drinkable. It's also very complex. Coca-Cola is subsidized. It's very cheap. It's not a one issue fix at all. And we have some evidence from the 60 households that in households that have two separate lines, one that's that take the water up to the Tinacos, but one that goes directly to the kitchen tap, those families actually drink that tap water when it arrives, but it's not always there. So again, this is, there's, it's a desmadre, it's very <laughs> complicated. But I think again, with enough people on the team, there you can start seeing all of the different facets, or you could start imagining what are the ways, what are the relationships that are gonna have to change in order to make it so drinking water out of a tap is at least an option, like it used to be, before 1985. And here's pictures of a whole bunch of the teams that were involved in creating all of these beautiful images and graphs and slides. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach you. Oh please, yes. Yeah, okay, so this is forward. Okay. And then back is that, but you have to push it really hard. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a Luddite, so you're gonna see that my slide deck is like really leaves a lot to be desired. Um, but I think you'll also find that if you just like close your eyes and imagine that Inyake slides are there, this presentation is gonna go a lot better. So, okay, um, I hope I can make up for it with the actual text. Um, so, um, yeah, I wanna echo what everyone has already said um, about this great, really, really terrific, um, uh, eclectic group of speakers and um, really great uh, panels that we've had uh, so far and will continue to have today. Um, and thanks to Gabriela and, and Diane Davis for, for inviting me. Um, it's, it really is an honor to be here, thank you. Um, so, ready for a history lesson? Um, so it seems that uh, you know, in Mexico City today, a new ecological consciousness around water is taking root, especially around the rehabilitation and conservation of the basin of Mexico's aquatic resources and systems, particularly Lake Texcoco and Lake Xochimilco. 
many of my fellow uh, conference participants have been very active in these blossoming movements, leading studies, making project proposals, and negotiating with government authorities at various levels. The uh, movement Yo Prefiero El Lago um, that defeated Peña Nieto's mega airport project a few re uh, years ago in the old Texcoco lake bed was and continues to be a movement that has brought urban citizens and residents of, uh, of Atenco and other pueblos uh, together in a fight to rehabilitate the lake bed on more democratic, sustainable, and environmentally just lines. In many ways, I think this movement is emblematic of a recent trend, perhaps dating back you know, a few decades, in which a you know, professional class of researchers, urbanists, and scientists have you know, tried to operate in a more collaborative way with communities, urban and otherwise, across Mexico, a kind of synthesis of, kind of traditional top-down um, and bottom-up planning projects that aim to accommodate professional expertise and their social capital with popular and for lack of a better word, local environmental practices and knowledges. These lake and water rehabilitation projects seem like a radical departure from decades, or maybe I should say centuries, of draft and drain hydraulics across Mexico, from the European savants all the way to the prominent Mexican engineers who completed the deep drainage project in the 1970s, which consists, um, at least at the time, of the world's largest drainage tunnel. But how much of a radical departure are these movements and tendencies in water and environmental governance? How might a historical perspective on Lake Texcoco and its relationship with an expanding Mexico City unearth otherwise submerged histories of conflict debate, and alternative imaginaries. What has the Texcoco lake bed, both in its aquatic and desiccated forms, meant to the inhabitants that live in and around it, and also to a wide array of urbanites, especially you know, governing officials and professionals like architects, engineers, and urban planners? In short, my question to, for today is, where does Lake Texcoco, as both a material ecological reality and as a cultural representation fit in the longer history of Mexico City. So my talk is gonna focus on the history of environmental ideas in the basin of Mexico through the lens of its water landscapes um, and uh, put it in dialogue with changing political ecological conditions due to urbanization, popular politics, think the Mexican Revolution, and past engineering. A key idea is to explain how a historical perspective on the so-called Lake Texcoco problem, as it was long known in, uh, in Mexico, allows a deeper understanding of the contemporary context of environmental governance and imaginaries in Mexico City. Okay, here we go, first slide. <laughs> Again, imagining yaki slides here. Um, <laughs> But here you, you kind of see, you get a sense of, of the diminishing or the sort of receding lake uh, levels over time um, as, you know, as Mexico City is expanding. It's like they're in sort of opposite relationship, um, uh, uh, kind of like a negative correlation there. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these lake levels were, were always fluctuating, right? So like, you know, cartographers, engineers, they tried to fix, right? They tried to make legible the lake levels, but of course there are wet and dry seasons, and so there was all kinds of fluctuation. But this gives you an idea of what was happening uh, over time. Um, all right. So first, I want to, you know, the first part, I want to talk a bit about the, the consolidation of draft and drain hydraulics. And I'm going to focus on two flashpoints of intellectual and governmental activity around what to do with El Problema del Lago de Texcoco, the first in the 1870s and 80s, and then the second in the 1920s and 1930s. The first flashpoint um, has been told and analyzed quite a lot, including by my esteemed colleague on this uh, panel, Manuel Perlo. So I'm not gonna belabor it here, but I do wanna sort of um, talk about it a little bit. Basically, the authoritarian and positivist inclined regime of Porfirio Diaz sanctioned a massive drainage project, the general drainage of the Valley of Mexico, consisting primarily of a long canal and, um, and tunnel that connected the city's new sewer system and the northwest corner of Lake Texcoco 
to the uh, Rio Tula and the Panuco River watershed outside of the basin of Mexico. Um, and the, you know, the objective was to save Mexico City from its perennial flooding problem, stave off disease, and open land for potentially other productive and speculative uses, uh, you know, capitalist land and industrial uses. It's important to note that not everyone agreed with the massive drainage plan. Uh, the Prussian geographer and naturalist Alexander von Humboldt is widely cited uh, for his ideas critical of the Spanish uh, drainage paradigm, but lesser known are the Mexicans who drew on Humboldt's ideas to vocally and publicly denounce the drainage project. They advance, advanced a kind of early uh, landscape nationalism, celebrating a past indigenous civilization, um, something that folks today continue to do, uh, a kind of cultural affect that was bound to scientific theories of desiccation that were prominent at the time and reigning miasm miasmatic-based theories of disease. For example, the engineer Manuel Balbontin supported Lake Texcoco's rehabilitation and argued that lake drainage would turn, quote, a place that should be gorgeous and productive into a kind of marsh that would e eternally sustain sickness. Lake drainage, of course, as we know, prevailed. It turned out environmental or miasmatic theories of, di of disease were more likely to be wielded to support drainage than they were to be uh, used to support lake re rehabilitation. The goals of national urban progress were wedded to massive state engineering and the ability to quote unquote conquer water, right? No matter where you are in the world, not just Mexico. However, the anxieties of environmental deterioration through lake drainage manifested in the general drainage project. Luis Espinosa, who was the chief engineer of the, uh, des the Desagüe General, designed the system to drain only what was deemed to be excess water or flood waters, and to maintain a reservoir at the lowest point of the lake bed. These folks were in some ways in tune with the, cha the basin's changing ec material ecology and were aware of the specter of a dust bowl, right, of desiccation imperiling Mexico City. So let's fast forward now to the next flashpoint, the 1920s, a moment of post-revolutionary reconstruction where ideas of reform were emanating um, and pervading the country uh, because of the social convulsions of 1910 to 1920. And as we know um, from Antonio's presentation, the 1917 constitution that bestowed Mexican campesinos with the right to land and waters. The general drainage was no panacea to the city's environmental woes. In the late 1910s and early 1920s, this, the city, still recovering from a decade of revolutionary violence and destruction precipitated by Diaz's rule, began to experience a different kind of Porphyrian wrath, the wrath related to its past engineering. Flooding returned due to the sedimentation in the lake bed that raised the lake bed. Meanwhile, the city is beginning to sink. Um, but, it, but really, a new menace loomed that of the dust storm, dried out saline sections of the lake bed that did not support most vegetation, rose up during the dry season and thrashed the city, causing res respiratory disease and general nuisances. From Excelsior, 1932, newspapers are like, littered with these kinds of reports about the dust storms from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, well, and on and on. Um, you get a sense of, of what kind, you know, what the, the sort of experience was of living through one of these dust storms. Urban experts, scientists, planners, and engineers debated what to do in newspapers and professional meetings. Drainage had not solved the Texcoco problem, it had simply changed it. So three different paradigms emerged in professional circles. And the only thing really that they agreed on was the need for more engineering, right? You needed to re-engineer the lake bed to address these problems. The first position was land reclamation via fertilization. Wash the land of its salts, make it productive for agriculture. This was actually briefly pursued under Francisco Madero during the revolution, and a lot of engineers and scientists continued to maintain it as a 
viable possibility. The second was, again, lake regeneration, rehabilitate the lakes, uh, following in the footsteps of Balbontin and others, this was given more and more attention publicly. In part, I think, since it called into the question pre-revolutionary engineering um, the most emphatically, right? The old regime was responsible for our woes. And then the third way, uh, position was afforestation, right? And yeah, same slide as Iñaki had, the other, uh, had yesterday. This was uh, Miguel Ángel de Quevedo, Mexico's first, you know, sort of, uh, environmentalist, one might say, um, the apostle of the tree, um, as he was known. Um, he argued actually that it was too late for lake recuperation um, and fertilization was you know, sort of against the laws of nature. So he said the only remedy was to um, limit the lake drainage to the floodwaters as was originally intended and cover the lake bed with halophytes, right, or salt resistant plants. Once again, lake drainage prevailed. This time joined to arguably an even more hubristic engineering project, land reclamation for agriculture. This happened under the reform government of Las Cárdenas. Okay, I think I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm gonna skip a little part here. Um, but Cárdenas was kind of able to kind of kill two birds with one stone with this fertilization project. He was you know, trying to resolve an urban dilemma of the dust storms but also grant Campesino's land. Um, the salts were stubborn. The, salt, the salts struck back. Um, they they uh, complicated fertilization efforts um, and the land reclamation project ended. So on to part two a little bit. Uh, in this part, I want to discuss the shift from the sanitary hygienic city to what, what, we, what we might call now the ecological city, at least at this point, ecology entered in the discourse of some professional circles and in the wider cultural realm. This story begins in the 1940s and 50s. The context is uh, for this new ecological framework is the following. First, the basin's ecological reality. The worsening dust storms were bad enough to frequently close the airport. Land subsidence due to underground aquifer, aquifer depletion worsened flooding and damaged buildings, and deforestation um, continued to be a problem in the surrounding hills and mountains. Um, actually, this is an image of Cárdenas' uh, fertilization project. And here you have Moya, Rodrigo Moya's photograph of the Tolvanera in about 1957. Second, Mexico City experienced an urban boom in the 1940s and 50s in which informal per peripheral settlements expanded due to um, rural urban migration. Here you have, uh, well, Hector Garcia's Tlaloc uh, from 1960, floodwaters. Um, and here's the sort of informal communities popping up on the eastern side of Mexico City around the lake bed. And then third was the global context of an emerging science of ecology and a renaissance of Malthusian overpopulation theories in the midst of Cold War concerns about communism spreading in Latin America. Mexico City hosted visits by key post-war American conservationists and Malthusian thinkers like Paul Sears and William Vogt, both of whom were highly influenced by their discussions with Mexican experts about the problems of the Basin of Mexico. These North American folks, however, rarely thought in terms of urban ecology. In this context, Mexican urban experts and scientists, Enrique Beltran, Alberto Arrai, Guillermo Sarga, the list goes on and on, contributed to Pan-American discussions about ecological degradation and advanced a decidedly urban framework for ecology. They understood the basin of Mexico as an urban ecology in crisis and out of balance. They perceived a set of interrelated elements and problems, desiccation, deforestation, subsidence, dust storms, and flooding that were intimately linked to the city's expansion. And these problems, they believed, could only be remedied via the right dose of technical expertise and state authority. Many of these folks uh, again proposed the rehabilitation and protection of all of the basin's lakes. Many also held a deep disdain for informal working class settlers on the eastern fringes of Mexico City, what is now Ciudad Nezualcoyoto, Ecatepec, and other uh, places. For them, conservation and environmental governance belong to the export experts, not to the poor. This is what I've called in, in other places uh, Mexico's technocratic environmentalism, 
and it was actually quite innovative for its time, possibly unprecedented. I certainly haven't found much evidence of this kind of urban ecological thinking existing contemporane contemporaneously elsewhere in the world. In the 1960s, this technocratic environmentalism seeped into the halls of power. The soil scientist Nabor Carrillo, concerned about land subsidence, dust storms, etc., spearheaded Project Texcoco, um, and then the project gained, gained financing in the early 70s, and by the 1980s, the lake bed had been re-engineered once again. Project engineers literally uh, engineered a new lake, aptly named after Nabor Carrillo, by subsiding land, land that had been raised by sedimentation through extracting water from the aquifer. They created other regulatory flood control ponds, afforested the saline encrusted lake bed with various halophytes and reforested surrounding hillsides. Here's an image when I went to the, see the project in 2007. This may have been the world's first urban ecological rehabilitation project. And it was a project that scientists and urbanists from various parts of the world visited to learn from. Here's an important point. This is not a story of West to the rest diffusionism, but rather of Mexican experts participating in a global discussion about environmental governance and conservation and figuring out solutions to very particular local ecological problems. It was also Janus faced. It was evidently an ecological project, but also one that in many ways exacerbated environmental injustice and fostered industrialization. A parastate company, Sosa Texcoco, became the largest salt producer in Latin America, and the Texcoco project also included a major city landfill located adjacent to working class colonias. Moreover, access to the federal protected lands was highly regulated and generally not open to the public. This was no urban park, only a place meant for technicians in enclosed state space. So I have some concluding remarks, but I sense that I'm about out of time or already out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go just very briefly uh, say a few things. Thank you. This enclosed state space, I argue, is the context for the airport project, possibly the last hurrah of this exclusionary vision of the lake bed. The enclosed exclusionary space allowed the airport to be approved, albeit temporarily. This was a turn back to production, not agrarian, not about industrializing the salts, but fitting of a new model of globalized neoliberal capitalism and tourism promotion. The Atenco led Yo Prefiero El Lago movement that defeated the airport was also the product of past environmental imaginaries, as well as of recent tendencies that have linked professional environmental expertise with community needs and representation. This movement, which is manifesting itself in the new Parque Ecológico, spearheaded by Iñaki, represents another moment in the cultural, political, and physical palimpsest of the Texcoco bed. It represents a new environmentalism, a political ecology that takes from various historical imaginaries and practices of the lake bed and integrates the ideas of multiple groups of people. Although not conflict-free, the new park project constitutes a convergence of popular social environmental demands with long-standing but previously more technocratic ideas about ecological rehabilitation. So I'll close there, but I'm eager to uh, contribute to some of the discussions from yesterday's panel. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Diane, thanks again for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Gabriela, thank you very much for making me have the chance to present uh, ideas, thoughts that I've been working in the last years. And um, this is a great conference, let me tell you. Um, the the um, blend of, of expertise, of backgrounds, um, 
really make possible to discuss the, the current issues of, of water uh, problems, water projects, water dreams. And history, of course, is vital to understand everything we do, especially in relation with water. Water, not only for its past memory, but also for the works of people 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 200, are present in our lives. So um, we, we benefit from, from history and from archaeology and, and from uh, colonial history and, uh, and so forth. Um, in a way, uh, the, the, um, I have to point out that uh, Matt Beats um, led me to work in the topic that I'm presenting today because 10 years ago, he was a postdoc at uh, the National Autonomous University of Mexico at the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas. You remember that very well. And he organized a, a wonderful colloquium on, on, on the ecology of, of, of Mexico. And uh, he invited me, he came to my office and invited me uh, please be part of, of the colloquium. And I said, you know, I don't want to repeat the, you know, the old stuff that I've been working. I, I, I do want, you know, something new. And I said, could I speak about the, uh, the soil of Mexico City, the underground soil? And he said, well, <laughs> if you want to, go ahead. And then I discovered uh, during the research I did for the presentation, that most of the work on the soil of Mexico had been done by engineers, by um, very specialized people. Nabor Carrillo's name is always there, but also Marcos Masari, Raul Marsal, and a number of, of scientists who worked at the National Autonomous University of, of Mexico who were for the first time doing, uh, taking samples, 10,000 samples of, 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 of the soil of Mexico City. That was in the 50s and the 60s. So we didn't know much about the soil. Of course, we knew there was subsidence. We knew that we were on a old lake and so on, but, we didn't know really where we uh, were standing on. And uh, that uh, science has uh, moved in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. So I discovered a lot of things and uh, I realized that I had to work on um, aquifers, which are the, the main source of water for Mexico City. Two thirds of Mexico's water supply comes from the underground. And of course, when we have problems with the Kutsamala, we, we cry out and you know, we complain, but it, that represents only, uh, just for Mexico City, only 15, 20% of the total supply of, of water. Um, Last year, I um, began um, a project called Aquifer Protection and Prevention in Mexico. So uh, there is a small group of social scientists who are working on, on aquifers. And uh, I stress that because we have, and we've disco I've discovered that, like, 100 to 150 um, scientists who are doing research on Mexican aquifers. The, the, there is a large group of people all over the country doing that, but very few social scientists. No historians, for example, we would love to have historians tell us something about uh, aquifers. In, in the Yucatan, you have some people, anthropologists, who have 
don't work. But the, in the rest of the country, you don't find that. So uh, the ideas that I'm going to share with you are uh, the result of something that has happened in the last months. And um, we uh, want, uh, at the place where I work, the uh, Instituto de Investigaciones Sociales, to have this seminar and to bring the expertise of um, different um, people, different institutions, and different approaches to aquifer protection and, and if possible, restoration. So, uh, full of hope, <laughs> I present to you these ideas, although um, <laughs> Enrique Lomnitz um, lowered my, my expectations when, because he has always been one of my champions regarding we can do a change, we, we, we can do a difference. And hearing him saying, well, this is a desmadre and it's so difficult to work, really, uh, <laughs> you can imagine what I felt. But no, no, we, we have, I'm going, I'm going to, to end with, with a note of hope in this presentation. There is no question about that. Okay, so um, I'll go very fast on, on, on the slides. Um, you know that worldwide, every day we rely more on groundwater. That's a fact. You, you find that in Mexico, in the U.S., you know, ask people about the Ogallala Aquifer and, <laughs> you know, people here in the U.S. are very, very concerned about what's happening in the largest uh, aquifer of the country, the one that provides water for so many states. So that they are very concerned of what's going on. But um, there you can see... Um, the areas of, of concern with red and, 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 and other colors. Well, in Mexico, uh, this is a trend that it's also taking place. We depend more and more of groundwater. Um, and um, there you see the uh, aquifers, we have 653 aquifers, and of them, 105 are overexploited. And there you can see in, in red the, the areas where the uh, overexploited um, aquifers locate. And interestingly, uh, this is happening where Mexico's most important large metropolis are located, Diane. Uh, urbanization, yes. Um, the urbanizing uh, trend is moving over overexploited aquifers. So it's, it's really a, a source of, of huge concern because um, these are the largest population growing places in the country. And, and you can see all over Mexico, um, in the northern states, but also in central Mexico, in Toluca, in Mexico City, in Puebla, Guadalajara, we are really uh, extracting a lot of water from the uh, aquifers and the cities depend much more every day on those resources. Um, some of you spoke five minutes? Oh my God. <laughs> the time flows as water. Okay. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, le let, me say, let me say that the number of concesiones is growing. And, and, and it's done in a way uh, that it's uh, worrisome because uh, there is no much control. Someone said that during the, one of the panels, that, uh, you know, w w when you extract water from, from a river, you know, more or less people are aware they 
It's visible. Whereas here we're dealing with the invisible. And I took that name, the, uh, making visible the invisible, from the United Nations last year uh, slogan on, on the uh, international uh, water day, make visible the invisible. And that stood with me, and I, I think it's very important to, to stress the fact that we have to make visible the invisible. Um, those are the, uh, the areas with uh, the, the most um, percentage of overexploited aquifers. If we see it from the hydrological regions, <laughs> sorry for that. Okay. And um, here you find some of the problems in, in the Yucatan, for example. There is water, saline water intrusion, but also in some of the northern states and in central, northern central Mexico, you have other processes which are also um, diminishing the, the water quality. Uh, one problem associated with um, aquifers is the discharge of polluted waters because uh, this uh, uncontrolled discharge, um, um, we have about 6,000 industrial wells without waste water discharge, discharge permission. And th these are sources of contamination for the aquifers. They pose a, a very uh, strong danger. And um, of course, I could spend a lot of time dealing with the, with the causes. Some of them have to do with the desmadre, the, the <laughs> very powerful um, uh, concept that Enrique Lomnitz brought to this conference. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yes, you know, we have a law, a water law that dates back to 1992, when we had a very, a very different situation. Superficial waters were more important than groundwater sources. Now the trend has changed. And um, we have a growing number of concesiones every year, every year. That's the way now industries, communities, cities are getting the water from. You know, every single community in Mexico wants a will. That's, that's self-sufficiency. That's the way they, they see the, their future. You know, we have to have a will. So um, no matter where you are, that's the way to control. A river, river, you know, they change now with climate change. Uh, there are problems. Dams, like in the case of uh, Monterrey, show that you can't rely so much on them, but the groundwater is always there. Where does it start and where does it finishes? We don't know. And that's one of the, the, the um, mysteries of uh, groundwater. Um, some of the consequences you know, we are used to say uh, Mexico City is uh, suffering from subsidence, you know, and that we, we can see that very visibly. However, that phenomenon is growing in all these large urban areas. So we find that kind of problems in Querétaro, in Oh, sorry, sorry, I did the wrong. In Toluca, in Celaya, and I could add other cities to the list like Aguascalientes. I think I have two minutes, one minute. Okay, yes, I can do it, <laughs> no problem. Um, challenges, well, uh, climate change will, will affect the supply of superficial waters, so we'll rely more on underground water. So 
and even stronger pressure on our hidden resources. Um, irregular settlements, Mexico City, you can see how irregular settlements are located in the area where the aquifer uh, recharges, in the, in the highlands of Mexico City. And there is a, a similar phenomenon all over the country. Uh, irregular settlements, not always from the poor, but also from the uh, high income groups who also invade uh, protected areas uh, are causing a lot of problems. And something I want to discuss with you uh, at this conference. We've had, you know, one, one would think, well, haven't you thought about uh, uh, artificial aquifer recharge? Yes, we've been working at least for 60 years in different projects. We have the people, we have the, the scientists, the engineers, the uh, uh, people specialized. However, we only have 6% of all those projects in service. Why? Why is so? You know, it's a question that I, that I pose to this conference. Uh, I have some ideas, some hypotheses, but uh, uh, I will discuss them with you. Uh, and um, I think we have many ways to solve. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessary uh, with groundwater, uh, artificial groundwater re recharge, but we, we can simply by changing the uh, um, energy subsidies to big farmers, we could make a change. So, so there is an array of, of measures that we can always um, do to solve the problem. And um, I want to end the presentation first with this slide showing a very interesting project in the uh, border of Kenya and Somalia, showing that yes, you know, even in the uh, fourth or the fifth world, yes, you can have recharge um, pro, uh, groundwater uh, projects and you have to uh, work on them immediately. Otherwise, you know, the future will engulf us and will invade us and, and very soon we might find a situation where the groundwater is not enough or uh, it's at a very, very deep um, condition and we have to spend much more money and community cities won't have either the money, the technology to extract that water. And uh, let me finish with the idea that despite all the uh, uh, pessimistic, if, you know, uh, emotions and, and trends we see in, in Mexico, I see a lot of future for this kind of projects, especially in places where public space can be created. Iñaki, I, I would, this is a question for you. Are you thinking about a groundwater recharge in, in the Texcoco project? Because I think projects such as Texcoco and many others in which people from Harvard are engaged should bring aquifer recharge and other practices, for example, prevent um, contamination uh, to work on that. And if we do that, yes, hope can be sustained and not the desmadre uh, <laughs> uh, trend that unfortunately is growing. Thank you very much.
okay, um, where is the stuff that I think that Manuel se lo robó? No. Ah. <laughs> and <Okay>. Perfect. <laughs> okay, well, before I start, I will say the same thing that everybody said. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Gabriela, for this invitation. I mean, uh, I've been honored to be here in this, in this type of, of presentations, and particularly in this table with the people that is, has previously talked to before me. And it's really, really nice to have this discussion and very interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary with a lot of different type of um, experts in, in water, which is one of the problems of the future for sure. So I will start to do very fast presentation about some data because today in the morning <laughs> I, s I heard that there is no reliable data at all. So this probably is not exactly true, but <laughs> about what is happening in Mexico City. Uh, and, but but um, and it's quite similar to the things that previous people said about from, from where we get the water in, in Mexico City. Basically, uh, uh, as Manuel said just a few minutes ago, we get a lot of water from ground, from the aquifer. It's about 14.6 meters per second is one of the main wheels, but also 2.1 cubic meters per second is from other type of, of wheels. So, so we have a lot of water from the, from the aquifer, which is highly important from Mexico City. And also, yes, of course, we, hold, we get from the Sistema Cuzamala and Lerma, uh, another type of water which is completely unsustainable because we have to bring them from 1,000 meters uh, to, to Mexico City. And, and get rid of, I mean, a lot of people used to use that water in the other basin. So, so it's a really interesting problem that we have. I mean, also, I, this is in, in English, surface water is 42%, groundwater is 58, main aquifer, is the main aquifer in Mexico City is about 80 to 130 meters. Shallow aquifer, nobody talks about the shallow aquifer, but the shallow aquifer is huge and important. It's in the south part of Mexico City, and it's about eight to 10 meters. It has a fast interaction compared to the main aquifer. The fast interaction is mostly in the rainy season, it fills in. Uh, the, the main aquifer it takes years, decades to fill in. So, so that is one of the important things to consider. And deep aquifer, uh, we, we started to generate this type of projects that to get water from deep aquifer that doesn't have any water entrance. So it's something like you have money in the bank for problems that, and you started to get money for the drugs from this money in the bank that you never will put money inside. So, so we have problems with that. And we started to have more problems now with climate change. I, I made this image uh, getting uh, all the information from Conagua, from the meteorological stations, and you can see that uh, from 1985, uh, the average is about 700 millimeters or to 900 uh, millimeters, and we are now in about six, 700. So we are, I mean, the amount of what the amount of rain is decreasing, is decreasing really, really fast in Mexico City, and now we have been about in about three or four years in a row in a, dry, in a drought. So uh, as you can see, it's 2020. We need two more years now, and you will see that this is going down more. And well, as many of you have presented, these are the green areas, and the green areas mostly are in the south part of Mexico City, and most of the water in the, from the groundwater comes from from the from the green areas in the Mexico City, and the, the south part of Mexico City is also called the Bosque de Agua. The Bosque de Agua is a, a huge area that provides water not only for Mexico City but also for Toluca and for Cuernavaca, and it's a huge land that is threatened now because of urbanization and non-organized non organization. So we have a huge problem that we have to solve, and. I, would, I, I will have this type of uh, uh, models that we made a few years ago about in which part of the Bosque de Agua has the highest infiltration rates. And in which part of the Bosque de Agua also 
we have a huge problems in terms of organization. And this is the high infiltration rates is bluer while the greener infiltration rates are, uh, I mean, the lower infiltration rates are greener. So we have the south part of the city is highly important in terms of infiltration and not only infiltration, but also uh, getting water from the, from the mountains. Uh, before of me, you talk about subsidence. Uh, you can see that subsidence is obviously going in the northeast part of the city, uh, which is in which place, uh, I mean, it's not only the problem of lack of water, also is the problem of floods. And the floods are in the areas that the subsidence is higher, so in the northwest part of the city. So you can see that in the general, I mean, the, uh, we made this model in which parts of Mexico City we have higher rates of floods. Um, as you can see, most of the part uh, have, we have higher rates of floods, which also have the shape of the five lakes system that we used to have before we try to dry out everything. So, la memoria, la memoria. <laughs> exactly. So, considering that, I, I was asked, uh, I mean, I was thinking about Diane saying wh what we should do in, in general terms. Uh, and I tried, and I've been thinking on that <laughs> I mean, in a very complex situation, I mean, in terms of legal problems, in terms of society, in terms of uh, in money problems, I mean, economical problems. And I came with this picture from the Stockholm Resilience Center in terms of uh, the sustainable uh, uh, development goals. Uh, if you can see the sustainable, sustainable development goals, the SDG, uh, are 16 or something like that, or 17. And normally the people says, oh no, I am getting the goal five or the getting seven. And they got every action in any people have a, a sustainable goal. I mean, you can destroy a wood and say, I am achieving the sustainable goal of something. So after uh, a, a lot of consideration, I, well, the Stockholm Resilience Center made this, this priority in terms of sustainable development goals, which is uh, 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 the biosphere area, I mean, the biosphere sustainable development goals are the most basic ones. If you don't achieve those, you can't go to the second area, which is the society area. I mean, you, don't, you can't have a society if you don't have an ecosystem. And you can't have economy if you don't have a society and that doesn't have an ecosystem. So if we have to prioritize, we have to prioritize those as DGs that are basically uh, uh, creating the function of the ecosystem in which the place you are living on. So I said, okay, that is helpful. It's really helpful in order to see which type of action you have to make in order to have, for example, water. And one of the things in terms of diagnosis is that we, I see that the traditional way in which, in which we have focused the, the urban development is based in this, uh, in this exactly opposite. We focus first in economy. We focus first in economic development in order to see if the society is good for the economical development. And if the society is good for, then we will have maybe some funds in order to make restoration or make conservation or something like that, which is completely the opposite and completely ridiculous because we, you don't have a healthy economy if you don't have a healthy ecosystem. So, and I will show you some of these traditional way examples. The first one is the basic story. I mean, Matthew already gave a very nice lecture about that, but this is some of the pictures that I got from, from a book. Uh, how we have dry out all the all the five lake system. Uh, I don't have the last one, but the last one obviously gets rid of the north part of the of the aquatic systems of the lakes or wetlands that are in the north part. And we already only have this one, which is the yeah this one. We already have this part, and this is completely uh, threatened by urbanization, and because this is. This is Xochimilco and this is Chalco. Uh, the Texcoco one is the, this one that is, we are trying to recover now, but, but basically where compared these small parts com with, with the things that we used to have before the, uh, the colony. Uh, so that is one of the ex best examples around 500 years that we have put economy 
in the in the based part. But recent examples are this one. For example, be, be, I mean, we have a very small, we have a very very small wetland, and we decided to build a bridge, a bridge that destroyed the wetland. And the, the worst part is that they say this is a wetland. Uh, they, they, they say this is a very good restoration project. I mean, and this is, they have the ability to say that this is better than the wetland that was before of that. So, so you can see that this is not a very good idea and this is a very good example of what, is, what we're talking about. Obviously, this happens. Obviously, this is in wet season uh, and you can see the consequences of trying to build something and, and have a wetland, I mean, and have a bridge over a wetland. And I like the high technology <laughs> restoration part of that they try to. So, but it's not the only example. I mean, now we, I am talking about directly in Xochimilco. The same example happens in, for example, massive tourism. Now they are saying that Mexico, that Xochimilco is a Tulum of Mexico City, which is, I mean, I am really, really afraid that they're trying to do that because everybody goes to drink. I mean, I am not against drinking. I, I said that beers are important, but, <laughs> but you, there is place for everybody. Um, for every, there is a place for everything. No, so you go to Garibaldi to have drink and drink and sing mariachi things. No, you don't have to go to Xochimilco. But it's not the only problem. The other problem is football. I mean, there is a lot of increment in terms of football courts and also other type of tourist traps that are not the interesting thing or tourism that can be thing in Xochimilco. It's not the only thing. You can see also this is a tweet made by Secretary of Medio Ambiente, lo local Secretary of Medio Ambiente, Sedema, and says the Altepetl, and because they say Altepetl, maybe they think that this is more, uh, more uh, um, ecosystem friendly. But basically, they create these huge fields of Sempasuchil full of pesticides, full of fertilizers. And actually, they change also the market to do that. So they, they change the market, and then they prices of sempasuchis go down, and then a lot of people couldn't sell properly their own production because of this. So this is not going in this direction, and this is made in the Bosque de Agua. So we have problems with that. This is also important, and uh, the two recent examples from now. Uh, one is Anuncia Sedema Bombardeo de Nubes in La Ciudad de México. This is also the engineering winning. Uh, today, I heard the news, Claudia Sheinbaum says, in the, in the few days, in the next few days, about two or three days, we will start the, the bombing of the clouds. These days, dry season, no clouds. But they want to do it now in order to increase the water. We, everybody knows, well, everybody that study this type of things know that that doesn't work at all. But they are trying to do that at this moment. Um, and in the other part, you have this. There is a, I mean, yesterday they voted this, this change of the law uh, in which they try to give more water to the people in different districts in, to the uh, developers on the real estate. So we have the first, a bad solution in terms of getting water, and second, a bad solution in, in terms of giving the water. So this is the type of things that we see all the time here. So, uh, ah, and finally, I wanted to say this because uh, today also I read in the news that Modelo, the beer factory that is in close to Apan, decided magnanismi, magnanis, mag magnanimamente in Spanish, say our, uh, we can give our water to Mexico City because we are in, in, in a good position to give them our water. So it refers to the first question of these panels. Who owns the water? I mean, I don't think that Modelo owns the water, but they decided to give us to, as a very nice gift to the Mexico City. So what does this, what, yes, it works. I mean, and I mean, again, I wanted to return to the yesterday panel in terms of, we have to start to thinking a little bit about the people that has been here for thousands of years, like Xochimilcans, and start to see what they did well and that, what they did wrong. And we decided, in terms of restoration of Xochimilco, 
to return to this. Uh, the Xochimilco is a world heritage, and you have the Chinampas. And the Chinampas are the best way to create agriculture, and that's the reason the Aztec civilization was there, because of the Chinampas. And the Chinampas are highly productive. You don't need fertilizers or pesticides, the, because all the fertilization comes from the lake. And I won't go in this direction because I am have very, very small amount of time, but we started to create a program of restoration of Xochimilco. Part of the idea is to get, again, owning the way of the water is processing in terms of, of uh, ecosystem services. So uh, we see, I mean, we started to work with people in Xochimilco, with Chinamperos, the people that knows about this, and uh, we create this thing called Chinampa Refugio, or Chinampa Refugio, or Refugio Chinampa, I don't know how to put it, which basically is, again, from, from, uh, from Lisa, uh, learning from the, uh, from the nature, and we started to create a filters, a biofilter here and here, with only plants, and not much more than plants, and they filter the water, and the water increase, the water quality increase really, really, far, uh, really, really high. I mean, you can see, I mean, by eye, you can see the, wat the, the water increment, but also we measure the water quality increment, and it's by far really, really impressive how we increased. And also, obviously, we have the axolotl, which is the refuge we create for. I mean, the axolotl is this very interesting species that we have, um, uh, that everybody loves at this moment, is everybody wants an axolotl now, uh, the acosil, another type of the charal, another type of species that can survive very well in this place, and also the water can be used for raising the crops. So this is a very, very good thing. So, but this is not only in terms of biological, and that's the way that I have to jump out from my comfort box, and I started to work with architects and sociologists and those type of things that normally I don't work with and then used to work with now are my partners and normally I work with all of them. But they start to create not only the technical part, which is the biofilter to, to understand what is happening, but also the agricultural part if, if this works. And we started to work with the people there and also create a certification with them. It's not a certification that we give because we are the, technical, the technicians we create the certification with the people because we want to know how do they feel about the, the, the certification. Because we want them to, to earn money, more money, because they have this refuge. And that's one of the other things that I learned. I mean, in ter it's not as easy as we thought in terms of economical part. Because the Chinamperos don't think as we think in terms of money. <laughs> So we are learning a lot in terms of how we create this and how we want to, for them to be a beneficial issue instead of being um, only uh, increasing the amount of money. So uh, I can tell a lot about that, but I won't because I don't have enough time. But it has to be with the question of math in terms of capitalism, because we have to rethink the way of we get the financial support, if the financial support is a very nice tool or not in terms of restoration and how we can preserve these type of things. So that is, I mean, I have a lot of information. I, I, I don't have enough time to do that, but I, I have a lot of information in terms of uh, Chimilco. We have been working for 20 years there, but I, I know that in the Bosque de Agua, there is a different type of productions that we have to go deep and deep in that direction, instead of doing these huge things that normally different governments have wants to do in terms of, oh, we, wa we will produce this amount of production for all of these people and they will be rich, and they promise they will be rich. And it's not like that. It's going every community to try to understand what are their needs, what are their desires, and how we create a restoration program in all the parts of the Bosque de Agua. And I want to finish, I'm finishing, <laughs> with this, I mean, preserving biodiversity, because I am a biologist, I'm sorry, I know that I, I told you, <laughs> Diane, yesterday that that is not, uh, that I will say the opposite that normally I we were discussing about the transdisciplinary. But um, I'm sorry, but preserving biodiversity, we, ha we can preserve our cultures because the biodiversity is quite linked to the culture. And we can preserve the ecosystem and then we can preserve the water. 
And from that, we can preserve the, the city. So that is the way that we think that we can start to do it. Obviously, it's by far more complicated than create a huge mega projects that are by far easier to sell. This is but more and more complicated because it has to go directly to the each community. But I think it's the, it's, the best, it's the best way to go a little bit slower, but better. Thank you very much. So you see that I had a very easy job to present the panel, and then Diane asked me not to fix any question beforehand and to leave it open no, to what I had to respond. And I think that it is uh, incredibly, we have 25 minutes, and um, we would like for this to be more a discussion um, so I will open to the public very uh, soon. We will get as much questions as possible. Maybe not all of them could be responded, but they are recorded, and we can continue uh, talking about those uh, after uh, we are, our time is um, done. I think that, like from Liz, is incredibly valuable. Like the work. Now you let me understand more, like Anne Davis' approach to, uh, to no hypothesis. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and I think that is incredibly valuable, that idea of intermittency uh, in the future, as that fluent time and fluent fluency that Diane was actually, and Gabriela was commenting yesterday, like how to deal with a less um, continuous source of provision of water, maybe in the future. I mean, the path forward seems to be that way. Uh, if we don't, like, urgently, reverse that path forward. So m the question for, for you would be, you said that you were collaborating with engineers and, and that um, it is difficult, f you understand the problem, but it is difficult for you to specialize that uh, problem. And how do you think that we should start working together so that we are able to uh, hybridize more the way in which we can move forward. If you have the, the, the hybridize more, or the, the way forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question for Matt. Um, I think that the 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 presentation was like extreme. Well, the the book has been a source for all my students uh, over the year since it was published in eighteen. Um, but it is like so well researched and telling so well the idea of the culture of drainage and like how like drainage is in the DNA of uh, like the disappearance of this amazing valuable resource in the water of uh, in the basin of uh, Mexico and. In this new ecological approach that you are um, studying, how do you think um, we could solve some of the conflicts that you were posing in the, for the previous panel's question? So there's a huge amount of conflict in the use, in the, in the use of water, and capital is there. And and in the in the up and valley where we are working, like the beer industry model is depleting the aquifer together with many other industries, by the way. Um, but it is difficult, and this relates to uh, Luis's uh, to reverse that no approach to the resource from a capitalistic neoliberal perspective. More in Mexico since 1992. So if you want to continue on those thoughts and the ones that you couldn't uh, finish, that would be wonderful. 
Um, and to Manuel, Manuel, I am so fascinated by your, your perseverance in always opening the like, new topic <laughs> for us, <laughs> uh, like your illumination 10 years ago to talk about or think about the soils, because I think that the aquifer cannot be replenished without soil restoration. So um, if, if you want to maybe tell us a little bit, um, so you, you were already telling us like, okay, many scientists are looking into this problem, but not historians or social scientists. There, is a, there are a lot of landscape architects, actually, who are looking into um, restoration of soils. Um, but if you could, conti could continue into that discussion, because you, you said the drainage, like the replenishment of the aquifer, only 6% work. Uh, so what are your ideas as a path forward? And I know that those uh, projects that you were look, uh, looking at in Africa were ones, but those are in kind of rural areas, and we are talking about urbanization and how to get a space for that replenishment in very, very, very um, paved um, environments. And Luis, um, maybe for, for, for you to continue talking a little bit on that idea of how economy um, and ecology and sustainability in its relationship to water, in the case of both the Bosque and, and Xochimilco, um, could be done, and maybe that relates to Matt's question as well, in the face of extreme and very rapid urbanization, with the projects that you were already showing that actually go against the protection and conservation of cultural landscapes, but also the replenishment of that, uh, those bodies of water. And then I will open. So if you want to briefly um, respond, and then we will get more questions. Liz, do you want to start? Sure. Um, OK, thank you for asking me what I would do if I <laughs> ruled the world, which I don't, sadly. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, you know, I think uh, so much of what happens in terms of conservation, environmental conservation, feels a lot to me like the way public health messaging works. So I'm a medical anthropologist, and one of the things I do is teach pre-meds and folks who are going into public health to notice all the ways that medicine and public health often reinforce class divisions by thinking that the answer is more education of the people that need to be educated. And so doing this project has been um, a great kind of reinforcement of that, of learning there's all these messages around Mexico City, save water, drink water, all these things, and most of the people in the working class neighborhoods that we spent are, there's really good reasons they're not drinking the water and they're doing more than anyone I've ever met and have incredible skills in terms of um, managing this resource and have a very intensely conservationist, um, I wouldn't say mindset, set of practices. And so it feels to me like it's important to not yet again reinforce these kinds of class divisions by educating people that don't need to be educated about how to do this and to think more about things like capitalism and the fact that Coca-Cola and beer companies are hugely subsidized and the way that the messaging often happens tends to be about, hey, you individual, you fix it. And I'm not saying that people in conservation or medicine or public health actually have the capacity to change the relations so that Coca-Cola no longer is so subsidized, but at least the blame in the education could stop. So that feels like one thing. It's not, that's not exactly about drinking water, but I think it's, it's about shifting an environment and maybe gets at some of these issues around trust. Um, and then in terms of things that perhaps feel more concrete, although I think not blaming people through billboards is a concrete thing, um, is that, and this is where I'm kind of ignorant and you all know a lot more than I do. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of resources are put into making Mexico City's drinking water 
meet water quality safety standards. And probably some of that needs to happen, but there needs to be more acknowledgement <laughs> that it's not drinkable because of intermittency. So could we think about putting the resources for making that water quality or water drinkable somewhere else, like at point of contact? Um, could different kinds of filtration systems be distributed more widely in different ways? And there's plenty of households in Mexico City, you've all been there, where the filter's broken and people are still using it, and or they're not. But there's actually different kinds of filtration systems, and Enrique, you and I had an early or conversation about the kind of ways you folks are dealing with that in terms of rainwater. There's also a lot of issues about heavy metals in, in water that filtration systems don't really deal with. Um, and actually, I don't know enough about that in terms of water treatment. But it, it seems like thinking about the grid as extending into households to, to kind of redistribute um, the impact of intermittency and to redistribute resources more widely to deal with intermittency for people that are already really good at dealing with it. Seems like we could think about that in terms of water quality safety, or the, the, the quality of water. Um, and I, I guess I can stop okay, there. Great. <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lorena, thank you so much for your question. I think it I think it takes us back to this issue of scale that we were starting to discuss last night. Um, and yeah, I'll say first off that, um, you know, there are a lot of large scale problems and there's a way in which we have to be willing to address large scale problems. Um, and I don't think it means that you know, we can't have sort of urban acupuncture and small scale, you know, interventions with planning and design. Um, I think all of that is very necessary and that's what allows or, or, or fosters, I think, the best, the kind of collaborative, cooperative work that people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to be wary of seeing that as the, like the silver bullet um, because then we, we minimize the, the, the planetary, right, the planetary crisis we're in, we, we minimize the regional, right, the regional watersheds, the regional bio, you know, the bio regions, right, that are urban, that are hinterland, that are intersecting all of these systems. Um, so I think they're not diametrically opposed. We can think big and act very small scale within that larger thinking um, and larger design questions. Um, and so it, you know, I'm thinking about what, what Inyaki and I actually wanted to talk about a little bit as well, the, the, this sort of the conflicts between um, you know, what Mexico City and residents around Lake Texcoco are asking for and the Valle de Mezquital, right? Um, there has to be a, some sort of process, governance process of negotiation, of conflict resolution um, that has to be in some way participatory and democratic. Otherwise, all our rhetorical, you know, our, all our talk about sustainability and democratic sustainability just becomes rhetorical flourish, right? So there has to be, and so, you know, if I were to rule the world, <laughs> right, it would be, you know, kind of how can we create institutions, transform old institutions into new ones in which we have a sort of regional, Bio, you know, bioregional commons governance, mm -hmm. right? And then you think, well, how does that happen? Um, that can't happen under our current political economy, right? So we have to start thinking about questions of degrowth. Mm -hmm. We have to start thinking about how we're going to decommodify because commons, of course, implies that there aren't mm -hmm. a ton of commodities. You know, we have to get off the production consumption treadmill and we have to open up spaces for people to be able to you know, indigenous communities, urban residents, you know, all kinds of sort of what we might call in the, under the umbrella term subalterns, right? To have a say, to have political participation, right? Um, and I think there are examples to follow in contemporary examples, right? The Chilean constitution that unfortunately failed, but that, you know, that open, would have opened up these kinds of spaces, ideally. Um, participatory budgeting, right? All these kinds of things are tools right, um, dispositivos, you know, like they're, uh, 
their policies, their, pro their proposals that we might, we might take up to address these kinds of questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Max. Thank you very much, Lorena, for your uh, for posing those interesting questions and comments. Um, groundwater preservation and protection, it's not either a technological problem. You know, the world has moved into that direction at least for 70 years. And there are countries extremely successful in doing groundwater uh, either preservation and protection and recharging. It's not, all, it's not a, a financial problem. We've had very important investments in Mexico City trying to do this. So where does the problem lie? Well, from my point of view, it's basically a problem of public policy sustainability. The lack of governments really to create the rules, the incentives to work in that direction. You know, it's great to have Iñaki in the Texcoco project. In a couple of years, if he's not, and I hope he stays <laughs> there, if he's not, someone else will move things in a different direction. And, and that's a problem we've had, we face in Mexico strongly. So um, I rely more on local projects, control 